the keynote address by Professor Kabudi to the University of Dar es Salaam Faculty of Law. Deliberately, I have avoided to use a PowerPoint. And when Professor Messer asked me, I did not give him the answer why. Because I, all of you, most of you are natural scientists and I could see the, when you are presenting methodology, this and that. So I said, now also let me stick to my profession as a lawyer. And the lawyer, in court, we don't use PowerPoints. We use our level of persuasion. So it is deliberate so that you also have a test of legal science, <laughs> just as a test of uh, our different uh, approaches to science. Uh, so, and, and it's, it is, uh, 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 <laughs> Initially, I was um, tasked to talk about public health care communication and advocacy systems including role of folk, me, uh, folk media. And that is where I also have put much attention. So I have also introduced the term role of folk media because I think folk media also goes quite well with the topic of indigenous knowledge systems. And uh, one would ask himself, a lawyer, talking about communication, advocacy systems, why? I have a background in journalism and communication. Having worked as a journalist in the 1970s before joining the university, and it was not my choice to do journalism first before going to the university. But in 1974 in Tanzania, the president of Tanzania, Mal Julius Kambaraki Nyerere, had passed what was known as Musoma Resolution, which meant what? All of us who finished high school from 1974 onwards, it includes one of your colleagues, Patricia Kigika, because we were together in the military service. We had now to go to military service for one year. And when we finished military service for one year, girls were allowed to go to university straight. Boys, we had to work for no minimum of two years before joining the university. So when I joined the university in first year, the girls I had finished with high school, they were in third year. And that is how Nyerere made gender balance and the equalization between boys and girls. And that meant what? what? When we got employed, when I was employed as a state attorney at three, the girls whom, with whom I had finished high school, they were already state attorney grade one. That was uh, Malibu's policy. So in those three years, when I was waiting to go to the university, then I was assigned to go and work in a, in, in a newspaper. Uh, there was no choice. You are assigned and you go. So I was assigned and I went. And at that time, there were basically two national newspapers. One in English, the Daily News, Daily, and the Sunday News Weekly, uh, published by the government. And the one in Kiswahili, the Daily Uhuru and the Weekly Mzalendo, which were owned by the political party in Tanzania, Tano, and later on Chama Chama Pindusi, because at that time it was a one party state. So during my stint in journalism was also when the time the media was engaged in different national projects and different national programs, including radio. And we had only one radio, Radio Tanzania Dar Islam, which had the Swahili service the English service and the uh, uh, service for the liberation movements of Mozambique, Zimbabwe, Namibia, South Africa, Guinea-Bissau, and Cape Verde, all being broadcasted from Dar es Salaam. So at that time, I was uh, in charge of, uh, of, uh, of uh, features, but also a page on poetry, Swahili poetry, in the, in the uh, newspaper. And it was a time when Malim uh, Julius Kambaraki Nyerere had introduced a lot of uh, policies through STANO and CCM letter, which are relevant to what is today, uh, what we are discussing. And one of the policies which was introduced then was Mtuni Afia in Kiswahili. In, in the English of that time, it was man is health, but the English of today of gender uh, sensitivity is human is health. Uh, so if you go to the old books, it is uh, man is health, if man is health, forgive them, because at that time, women were not part of the human. <laughs> so forgive, take things in context, and I always remind the young generation, take things in context, otherwise you see a lot of wrong things if you start evaluating something done in 1962 with the prism in the eyes of uh, 2016. But there was also another policy which was marginal high, 
water is life. And all these campaigns were literally, I was literally involved, including the Elimia Watu Wazima, adult literacy, because at that time I didn't put a lot of effort on adult literacy. And all of us were involved in adult literacy. So you can see uh, I have a background in, uh, in, in, in communication, uh, and I'm still sitting now in several boards of uh, newspapers, not only within Tanzania, but within the region, which includes actually the national media group uh, of newspapers and media outlets. But another interest for me when it comes to public health care is my childhood. I spent my childhood in two rural areas where the Anglican Church Missionary Society of uh, United Kingdom, but also of Australia and Tasmania, but also of New Zealand, they had built hospitals in rural areas to save the indigent people. One is the village where my mother comes from, in Berega, Jerusalem. A very old hospital, and today it has an airstrip, and I will explain why. And the other one is in Kilimatindi Hospital, in Manyoni, where my father comes from. And when I say Manyoni, the Zulu know the meaning of Manyoni. It is the same Manyoni uh, the town, this town as you find in Kwasulu Natal. And all these hospitals were in the rural area, saving the rural folk, uh, backed by specialists and consultants, saved by the Mission Aviation Fellowship. So once a month, there will be a plane, a plane landing from Nairobi at Kilimatinde and then Berega, and then coming also to Murugwanza, uh, not very far from here, Murugwanza, in Gara, uh, the, the specialists, and I still know the very good of Pyrex surgeon, uh, Dr. Wood. But there was one very interesting doctor from Australia, a missionary doctor from Australia, Dr. Paul White, who used a lot of folk tales of the Wagogo people to impart public health education. And actually has published a series of books in Australia when he went back on jungle doctor fables, using the local stories which we were told by our grandmothers on the fireside to impart health knowledge uh, to the people around here. To the extent that actually uh, many people became uh, knowledgeable even those who were illiterate or semi-illiterate. And I still remember in 1982, when my paternal grandmother was brought home in Himidi National Hospital, and she had, a, she had a, 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 an oncological problem. And, uh, and the doctors, when they were uh, reviewing the case, I mean, the professor, when he was reviewing the case with the specialist students, he used carcinoma, thinking my grandmother doesn't know. So in the evening, when I came back, he told John, the tree is drying, take me back home. I said, why? They have said I, had custom, I have custom. When I told the doctors, we were surprised. I told, yes, we come from a village where there's a hospital, and Dr. Paul White has educated all these rural people to know the local name, but also the scientific name, Dr. Paul White. This is why I have referred him one of the model public health campaigners and educators of the time in our areas. But went back to Sydney, and I think he passed on some two or three years ago. But if you Google Dr. Paul White, you'll see a lot of his books. For the rest of them, it was much more on evangelization and bringing people back to Jesus Christ. <clears throat> now, at the University of Dasna, my mother, among other courses I'm teaching, is environmental law and intellectual property rights with focus on indigenous knowledge systems. And the interest in this was ignited by a project in which I participated for five years, which involved Norway, Malaysia, Costa Rica, and Tanzania on biodiversity and uh, biopiracy known as medicinal plants in the south and the medicine in the north. And actually, this was a very, very interesting problem because many people don't know that among the poorest countries in the 50s and 60s in Europe was Norway. And they lost one of their fungi to Novartis. One employee of Novartis had gone to Norway for a holiday and he scrapped some fungi off the rock, went back, and they developed these, uh, these drugs or this medicine which he used in, in transplant of kidneys and hearts. And imagine the amount of money that Novartis is making. And Norway is getting nothing. Although today Norway does not want money, any money from Novartis because now they are rich because of their petrol, of their timber, and their fish. But it is out of that this project was started to help us also uh, not to go the way they went. Why? Because at that time, through the Institute of Traditional Medicine, Tanzania lost a lot of medicinal plants, but also a lot of knowledge. To, to, to Europe. They do research, they don't publish, but they are promoted because they, wanted to, they want to patent uh, those, uh, those, uh, uh, those uh, discoveries. We are told to publish or perish 
and the knowledge goes, and once it is in the public domain, you can't patent it. So you can see the difference. And that was the role of that project. How to assist, to assist our scientists to do research, but to also benefit from their own research, and not only publication. And then they become professor and be pauper professors when their colleagues, they're not even senior lecturers, but they are getting royalties out of the patents. That was the interest of Norway uh, uh, funding this service. And uh, in that way, I was in very much in contact and collaboration with some of the staff of the Institute of Traditional Medicine of what is now the Nkibili uh, University of uh, Health and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and the Allied Sciences, which actually was formerly was, was a faculty of medicine of the University of Dakar. And this was a faculty of medicine of its kind in Africa because the founding dean was an African, Professor Mone Koso from Cameroon. Marim did not want any professor from West Europe or from America. He took Mone Koso from Cameroon. And one of the things which they did, and I would urge IMS to correct their website, the Institute of Traditional Medicine was not established in 1991. It was established in 1968, the same way that the faculty was established by Marim. And actually, Marim not only pioneered the establishment of the Institute of, Marine, of Med, Med, uh, Traditional Medicine, but he, uh, he also deposited medicinal plants. Because very few people, people know that actually Marim in the 40s, he trained as a biology teacher at Makere. And he taught biology. And his area of interest was botany, and especially ethnobotany, as I'll come and explain later. So all of this made me uh, get interest in this area of also medicinal plants, but public health. And definitely, it was very, very interesting to discover that in the early 1970s, an East African from Kenya, Kokwaro, had published a book on medicinal plants in East Africa, which was then published by the East African Literature Bureau, which unfortunately in 1977 wound up when the community collapsed, but it has now been published by Nairobi University Press 2009. So already, uh, back in the 70s, uh, 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 Kokwaro had, 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 had done that. So I look at the uh, healthcare communication systems, but as I said, and uh, advocacy, but as I said, my focus will be a bit more on uh, folk media or what others call as aura media from all media. Communication. We're talking about public health communication which means it is a communication. And if you read uh, um, literature from Rajiv Ramal and Maria Lapinski, communication is at the heart of who we are as human beings. The heart of who we are as human beings is communication. It is our way of exchanging information. And if we don't exchange information, it's like when there's no pollination among plants. There's no pollination among plants that is extinct. Without the exchange of information, we as thinking, critical, cognitive uh, uh, creatures, we are gone. Uh, I don't know whether it was true, but when my father was uh, also sick from an, an oncological problem, he insisted daily to read more than five newspapers. He was in Fundisi, he was a Christian, a teacher. No wonder I said, why do you want to read papers daily? He said, that is the way to keep my brain alive. And I would want to go to my creator when my brain is still working. And it's true. Until the day he was promoted to heaven, uh, he had finished reading uh, uh, four newspapers, which means reading, but not only reading. Wherever in the evening I went back, it was his job now to summarize the newspapers. So I stopped reading papers. It was him now giving me the summary of what he has read in the five newspapers. Sick, but contributing to me to know. But in that way, he shared, he communicated, and I think it helped him to to, to go to his uh, to create a peacefully, peacefully. Uh, so information, communication is the heart of who we are as human beings. And James Gary categorizes information in two aspects. His transmission, but also a ritual. Because normally when we talk of ritual, uh, people think ritual, uh, uh, something which, uh, especially because we are talking about traditional medicine and, uh, and uh, uh, people may think uh, ritual means uh, things which uh, are used to confuse and confound uh, which uh, border witchcraft. And uh, when uh, Professor Kaya was talking about preservation of a tray, yes, in Kiswahili there is a saying, which means the one who uh, 
the, the, the divides secrets, trade secrets of the family is not a noble son or a noble daughter. Which means what? That was the OA also protecting uh, the, the knowledge, just as the, the modern medical doctor would be in a, a white gown when he's doing general medicine, or in green when he's a theater, so that when the blood spills, uh, it doesn't scare anyone. Imagine a surgeon uh, doing an apparatum in a white dress and then comes red. Everybody will run away, but when it is green, and then uh, you, know, you don't see anything. Uh, it rhymes with. So equally that way. So there is the, the transmission, but there is also, also the ritual aspect. And the Curry says, after communication serves as an, it serves an instrumental role, it helps one to acquire knowledge, but it also fulfills a ritualistic function, one that reflects human as members of a social community. There are rituals to do every day. Each one of us has a ritual he does in the morning when he wake up. Uh, when I got married to my wife, Amina, she didn't know I come from a place. Our ritual is, even your wife, in the morning, you must greet her. Good morning. How did you sleep? Uh, how are you feeling? Despite all the other things, the activities which are going on, still, you must <laughs> greet her. It's a ritual. Uh, others don't have that ritual. It's a ritual. <laughs> and someone will think you are crazy asking all those questions. And for the last two hours we have been very active. Yes, despite being active. How are you? Uh, how are you feeling? <laughs> and how are you going on? So it has this, uh, which makes actually us to be a social community. So communication can be defined as the symbolic exchange of shared meaning. Symbolic exchange of shared meaning. meaning. This is why when all of you uh, who are doing uh, these laboratory things, I could share, I could see <laughs> the, the, the shared meaning uh, when it was uh, Nondo, uh, when it was uh, my sister from, uh, from, uh, from Kenya, uh, I could see uh, even the arrangement of the slides, even the ending, thank you, questions, I said, eh. <laughs> so you can see. So again, these are communicative acts. Transmission and the ruralistic. And actually, when we talk about communication and especially on strategic communication, Rajiv Ramal and Maria Rapiski again come to, uh, to my assistance. And they have identified three important intervention considerations from this view of view of information. To them, the first important intervention is the realization that communication interventions do not fall into a social vacuum. They don't fall into a social vacuum. There is a social context in which communication goes on. Just as we are aware we have been communicating today, there is a social aspect. Our first talk from Professor Mesa, there was a social context. And no doubt his university is invested in the sovereign. Yeah. sovereign. Not only American University, it's American University of the Sovereign. It's a social context. His approach is addressed in that. So there's no information which is neutral. Yes, we talk about objectivity, and especially you who think there's objectivity in empirical research. I doubt if there's a hundred percent percent objectivity even in empirical research. Leave alone us who are allowed to have diverse views. And nobody is wrong and nobody is right because you are all striving to know what is true. So, information is received and processed through individual and the social prisons. It depends also upon factors such as beliefs, interpersonal relations, cultural patterns, social norms. Yes, our beliefs affect the way we communicate, the way we choose what information to communicate. But also as adults and like children, you know now we are at the age we, 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 we acquire information that we want, you choose. What you don't want, you, yeah. 
and the kid who had problems, he wants to read the whole book when he has to write his uh, semester. So I told him, use the index. In the index, you, you read a hundred books, but you read exactly what you want. The day you have luxury of time, you read more. But use the index, which means choose. And all of this impacts on us. Our historical background. There are things I can say in Tanzania and discuss openly, but I can't do in one. Not because I have lost my freedom, but because I'm sensitive. Yeah. There are things I can interrogate in Tanzania, but I cannot do in Burundi. Not because I'm a coward, because I'm sensitive. And they are saying things you can't talk in Tanzania. Nobody will understand you. We we'll just look at you. But they are normal in Kenya. In Kenya, would have asked where Kabila Gan, which tribe are you? In Tanzania, someone look on the wall. So what? So, so every, all these things also inform the way we, we communicate. And as I said, in that system, a good communicator must know the social setting. If you don't know the social setting of what you want to communicate, it's awful. And I remember my father once telling me that he went to Germany and he was given to deliver a sermon in Stuttgart. He gave a wrong example. And immediately the whole church congregation was quiet. He gave one example of Hitler and the Nazis. And he thought, now I'm propounding the gospel of redemption. <laughs> the horse were not impressed. Did you know why he told me that? It's because I also once made a mistake when I went to the University of Leiden. And I was talking about the African God is green, the European God is greedy. And my host could not understand. I'm saying the European God and the Arab God is greedy. And the African God is green. So I learned my, my, my ways. I said, oh. So we're coming to, to Rwanda, I had to buy, uh, ask people know what to say and what not to say. <laughs> not because of anything, because of the social context. The second, the second, the second to them, it is the argument. There are normally discrepancies between messages disseminated and received. Always. And this depends on the exposure and the readiness of the one who receives the message. Which means, again, you need to know the social context, the people you are dealing with, in order to know that, so that you assist them to narrow. And the third thing which they argue and which I accept is that communication is a dynamic process. It's a dynamic process. So when we're talking about public communi I mean, communication for public health care, we should know it is a dynamic process, which means changes from time to time. And especially in the issue of health, public health communication. Because problems do arise at different times. At one time it was tuberculosis. At one time it was a uh, 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 now it's HIV AIDS. I'm sure uh, at one time Ebola. Uh, I mean daily. So it means it's a dynamic, and you need to come with different uh, means of how to communicate and do the evaluation. But if uh, there is an area which needs a good communication <coughs> strategy, is health. And health is both. Natural science, but health is also social science. Uh, the whole debate whether food is, is medicine and medicine is food is also an aspect of, uh, of social sciences. And this is why now in some universities in Europe, or even in Asia, and I think Africa, now we have many things which are known as me medical anthropology. Medical anthropology. In Tanzania, we don't talk about our, 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 our tribes. No. And now actually it is even difficult for us, the middle class. Because typical Malimu at the university, Malimu would always come twice or thrice a year and they would scold that marrying a girl from your home area is zero crazy. Go far. <laughs> now we have gone far and our kids now are Tanzanians. But still, there are two professions in Tanzania they will still ask you. They would want to know that. Medical doctors and police. And one time I asked a colleague of my, 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 my last 
my, my, my younger sister, the last born, she's a medical doctor. Why do you insist? He says there's still a belief in medical anthropology that there are certain type of uh, uh, elements and the maladies which are prevalent uh, in a certain area and in certain type of uh, people. Uh, you talk of Bilihazia around Lake Victoria, but you don't talk of Bilihazia in central Tanzania which is semi-arid and dry. And the police, to the police I knew it is just a social prophology of our colonial masters. Because for them they divided tribes which are martial and the ordinary tribes, but also tribes which were prone to criminality. Uh, and even in the role of provocation to today, uh, we still differentiate. Uh, uh, in Tanzania, if you are muhehe and you are provoked and you kill, that is a very good uh, mitigation factor because they know you are high tempered. But if you are Mzaramo from the coastal area where there are jobs, someone from the coast uh, is insulted and kills, they say no, no, it was deliberate. Because for you, insults are part of a language of system. Why do you get angry? But uh, that's not the point what I want to say. Public health communication is both natural science and social science. And actually it needs uh, a multidisciplinary, an interdisciplinary approach in getting this message. That is where now you have the, uh, the combination between journalists, mass communicators, and, uh, and uh, the medical doctors, just as when you are coming to these days, I mean, medicine is becoming more equipment, and now there are degrees of biomedical engineering. So we also need to have uh, uh, biomedia and biosamphora. Advocacy. Unfortunately, when we talk about advocacy in Africa now, uh, we have left this role of advocacy to activists. These are two different things. You don't, it does, an activist uh, does act of advocacy, but not all of advocacy uh, means there must be a, a, a activist. In the health profession, advocacy is a core competence of professional practice alongside scientific knowledge, alongside <coughs> clinical and the interpersonal skills. Advocacy. I'm talking about Dr. Paul White in our village, who went out after doing his clinics and the, and the rounds, he would go to assist the people in order to prevent advocating, advocating. Uh, although I'm, I'm, I'm praising him, later on I came to discover that actually when I joined Class 1 in 1962, uh, always in the morning, he would come and administer some uh, drops in our eyes. We didn't know. They were doing research on how to prevent trachoma. And this is why I come from an area where blindness, I mean, uh, sight impaired, is a, is, is a very big problem. But I don't use eyeglasses. Thank you to him because it didn't affect me. But if it had affected me, there was no prior informed consent. There was no prior informed consent. Uh, he just did it. Lucky enough, it turned well. But today I would insist on prior informed consent in any medical uh, research. But today, advocacy in, in public health has become important because actually uh, it influences institutional, community, national, and international policies. I'm sure one of the outcome of this uh, workshop will be how are we going to influence institutional, community, national, and the international policies in relation to uh, enhancing public health equity and leadership through indigenous knowledge. So advocacy has gone beyond activism. It has gone now in influencing policy, but also in changing behavior. So advocacy today needs to blend science, ethics, and the politics. We are dealing with health, but you can't avoid the ethics. That is what Professor Messer was telling us in the morning. But you can't avoid politics. Among people, I don't understand, but there's no way we can avoid them as politicians. Uh, and in advocacy, you have to deal with them. In the morning, we had to wait oh, for a DG from the Minister of Health, because you like it or not, eh? these are the people at the end of the day. How's your mom? Which was six to the break budget in Bungay? The Bumba person. The last one can I am Kawa Kula. I'm a civil. Things don't go. So you blend all that in, 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 in advocacy. 
and I don't want to take much of your time. If you read a lot of World Health Organization literature on uh, public health advocacy, you will see the so-called 10 step advocacy framework. I'm sure you all know the 10 step advocacy framework, which has been developed by WHO. Taking action, selecting your issues, understanding your political context, building your evidence base, engaging others, elaborating strategic plans, communicating messages and uh, implementing plans, seize, seizing opportunities, uh, being accountable, and the catalyzing health development. Don't want to go through them because I'm sure you access them. These are the 10 steps in uh, public health advocacy as developed by, 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 by WHO. And there are a, a wide variety of ways in which health professionals may engage in system level advocacy work, including a representative role. You can speak for the people. You are the ones who go to do research of their public health problems. So you can speak on their behalf. And I could see some of you have case studies which focus on a certain community. I think someone, when he was introducing you, said, well, I'm dealing with this community in, in, in KwaZulu Natal. It means now you can speak for those people in KwaZulu Natal on them. But also, empowering law, which means enabling the people to speak for themselves. And that is where we need now to focus. We are used to speak for the people. It's now our role, just as Dr. Paul White, that missionary, yeah? and mind you, he's an imperialistic missionary, still he was paternalistic. When I was listening to Mesa, he asked me today, Dr. Paul White was paternalistic, but still, he went, he empowered these people, and my old good mother, uh, 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 grandmother, even knew the wedding has not, although it was to his detriment, because once he knew, then he knew, like, perhaps he would have added three or four days if they had used another language. But let us empower the people, enable them to speak for themselves. But also a meditating role, meditating role, facilitating communication between the people. We need to enable them to talk to each other. Here we are, we are having traditional healers, traditional health practitioners. That's the term I would prefer. But they are also health practitioners. Let us allow them to facilitate a discussion, a talk, a dialogue between themselves, but also a modeling law, which means demonstrating practice to people and the policy makers, but also a negotiating law, uh, but dealing with those in powers, the Ministry of Health, Ministry of Science and Technology, but also a networking role, building coalitions. I think one of the outcomes from this Say this, this meeting is networking so that we build coalitions of how we advance the topic which we are dealing with. And because we are dealing with indigenous knowledge systems and we are dealing with communication and advocacy, that takes me now to folk media, or others are now calling it oral media from the word oral media. And the folk media have various just just pictures. Some call it uh, oral media, some call it traditional media, some call it informal media, some call it indigenous media. And these terms have been used interchangeably in referring to folk media. Django, in his 1977 publication entitled Folk Media and Social Development in Tanzania, he states that folk media refers to indigenous communication systems. And it was quite interesting to me, 1971, 1977, someone talking about indigenous communication systems, as we are talking about indigenous knowledge system. And to him, this indigenous communication systems is illustrated in the use of music, songs, dance, poetry, proverbs, stories, rituals, Rituals. Now I come from uh, an area where, as I say, my father comes from an area which my original semi-arid. Uh, and there are certain people who are known 
as they are. Today they can be weather forecasters. And if they have kind of animals, the porcupines, they will do ritual. Later on, we discover those porcupines assist them to know how, how this year there's a likelihood of rain or no rain. But they will do some rituals. And they will be much more uh, mesmerized by the rituals, not knowing actually. Uh, uh, and we thought they are witches to keep porcupines. But they knew. Uh, rituals. And another Tanzanian Valerian Laini, in his 1985 MA thesis, which is submitted in a, a Canadian University of Concordia, known as Integration of Mass Media and Folk Media and Protecting, Promoting Literacy for Rural Development. He says actually, folk media are indigenous means of communication founded on the cultures of the people, founded on the cultures of the people, and closely related to their traditional ways of life. These media, according to him, are vivid expressions of lifestyles and cultures of the people. And he says, folk media, has evolved through years and embedded themselves in the cultural development of the people. And to me, this is a media which we need to, 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 to research upon when we're dealing with the issues of our, uh, public health care, communication, and advocacy. And the answer goes further also. He looks at the integration into a specific culture of messages in a way, in a manner that requires the utilization of the values, symbols, institutions, and the ethos of the host culture through unique qualities and the attributes of each society, each community. Mind you, in folk media, Folk media is used for personal, but as well as for group information sharing and discussion. And the one area in folk media actually which is used uh, to, to tell someone how the truth, which under normal circumstances uh, you won't say is puppet, puppet, puppets, puppetry. You know, in puppetry, someone is trying to imitate something, but he's sending the message to the powerful. Uh, and the king uh, won't get angry because people are laughing, uh, they're giggling, but in, through puppetry, he's sending message. So even in public health, issues which are difficult to be discussed in public, especially when it comes to issues like HIV AIDS, issues of sexuality, through puppetry, uh, message goes, but it is seen as ah, everybody is laughing. But message goes, and in that way, uh, people are informed. They are aware, without being offended, uh, without feeling obscenities being discussed in 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 the public, because now it is embedded in their cultural, social, and the psychological thing. In other ethnicities in Tanzania, like the Sukuma, through dance and song, uh, is when people are ridiculed, people are criticized, people are told their truth. He'll be singing a song as if he's pretending, but he's telling you. The community does not look good at uh, very well, you're not very, uh, very well at the present community, because you don't go to other people's bereavement. And they're ever going to be laughing. But once you go back home, message sent and delivered but without uh, you be feeling bad. Uh, so that also can be tough. So power of folk media in changing behaviors in rural Africa. It's no emphasis. It's no emphasis. That's where it can change. Talking about rural Africa. I'm not talking about urban Africa. And the worst about peri-urban Africa, where there's a mix of everything. But in order to choose those messages, one really needs to study the society and the community in which he wants that message to go. And the folk media actually is very imaginative. There's a lot of imaginary creativity in folk media, which can also be of very much interest when it comes to issues of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, public 
the health, public health care, uh, and communication and advocacy. And this is why, in the case of Tanzania, there have been a lot of integrating of folk media and mass media, radio and now TV. Uh, before that, it was radio and now TV. A lot of programs in different campaigns using folk media now being integrated in radio and TV. And because we are talking about um, communication and, uh, and advocacy, the urban Africa is growing, and we cannot ignore that. So definitely now in the case of Tanzania, when it covers, comes to sending messages to the urban, especially the urban youth, you cannot ignore the bongo movies and the bongo flavor, the bongo flavor music, which doesn't excite me, but the young generation, they are crazy about it. And as I said, folk media has been quite useful in public health campaigns in Tanzania. And the issue of traditional medicine, uh, Nondo may not agree with me very well, but, uh, because he would want more support and more finances. But let me say there has been a very serious uh, effort in Tanzania in integrating uh, traditional medicine in our system. One, and I will continue referring to this many times, is the personal role of Malim Julius Kambaraki Nyerere. And as I said, he himself had interest in traditional medicine. Actually, quite interesting, in 1991, he was able to mobilize funds and they organized the first international conference on traditional medicine plants, which was done in Arusha, Tanzania. And out of that international conference, he got some money from Brazil everywhere, because at that time he was in the South South Commission. They published a book which is known as the uh, Proceedings of International Conference on Traditional Medicine and Plants, published by the Islam University Press and the Minister of Health in 1991. There were some few copies which were being sold by Amazon. I'm not sure whether they are still there. If, you, if they're still there, please get that book. And he invited people from all over the world. And the many people were surprised. Him, Julius Kambarani, after retiring from presidents, he's mobilizing funds for international conference on, uh, on uh, traditional medicine plants. Why? And it is there where he developed his secrets. He says, listen, I was a natural scientist through and through. Even the scholarship he got to go to the United Kingdom. He went there to study chemistry and physics. And for one year, he did physics and chemistry and physics. But there are two Irish, two Irish white fathers from Ireland who convinced him to change, with whom he had taught him the world. They told the young Julius, Tanganyika does not need a physicist or a chemist. Go and do social science to come back and assist your people to fight for their independence. And that is why now I had to move to Scotland, University of Edinburgh, now to do an MA in social sciences and dropped the natural sciences. But in his retirement, he went back again to the natural sciences, which were the passion of his, uh, his youth. But also Tanzania now has enacted, a, in 2002, enacted a piece of legislation, a law, which is known as Traditional and Alternative Medicine Act of 2002, Act number 30, 23 of 2002. And this is a big stride because traditional medicine was considered to be witchcraft, legally, under law. And some of the practices in traditional, by traditional healers were categorized as the witchcraft practices under the witchcraft ordinance, which is now the witchcraft act. Though, witches are not only a preserve of our continent, they are also witches. They are still witches in Europe, and they are witch witches. And uh, they were witches in Europe. Even after the Roman Catholic Church, through Inquisition, banned thousands of witches. Uh, this is one of the chapter which the Roman Catholic Church does not want to talk about. Men, especially women, who were suspected to be witches, they were caught confessed to the priest, eh? submitted everything they were using, and then they were burnt. And this propelled the development of science and technology in Europe, perhaps. And I'm told, I'm not sure, and as a lawyer, uh, must be very careful, I'm not sure. I'm told one of the biggest rivalry in witchcraft in the world is at the Vatican, because all those witches who were burnt had delivered the information of how they do it. And I'm not 
disparaging the Roman Catholic because part of my family are Roman Catholics. Just telling So even after the Inquisition to today, they're witches. And for the first time when I went to Germany, uh, my, my brother here, Kaya, is here. I was surprised that there are witches advertising TV, TV the hexing, that I'm a witch. She's, she's not even afraid in TV to say she's a witch. <laughs> and the typical idea, uh, when I got a daughter in Europe and uh, my good friend Kaya is here, helped me. You know, typical person from Tanzania, I didn't know the meaning of flowers. So after getting a daughter, Kaya is asking me, have you bought flower flowers? I said, flowers for what? <laughs> I've just seen the baby and uh, I'm very happy. Say, oh, 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 oh. This German won't understand you. Let us go and buy flowers. So we will rush to somewhere where they say flowers. Just tell them, I've got a baby girl. Don't choose flowers. You may choose the wrong flowers for the wrong girl. Okay. <laughs> because you may take yellow and they think you're going for bereavement. <laughs> so I said, okay, indigenous knowledge also there is very important. So now I'm telling the woman, and uh, my good friend Kai was talking in German once, very good flowers. Uh, because you know, also when you are there, you must impress the Europeans that you are a bit civilized. So get the <laughs> best flowers, and then we took them there. But uh, in that act, what is important in that act, the 2008, it has established the traditional and the alternative health. Really? Listen to the language. Traditional and the alternative health practice council. It is health practice council. And actually they register themselves through registration form number 10. There's temporary registration and then permanent registration. It's a big advancement. It's a big strike, although more needs to be done. That's why I say no, no, might not be very, very comfortable, but something has been, has been done. And actually when we were discussing about the march, the collaboration of the two, there's also a very interesting article which I would urge you to read for brainstorming by Mwambo, Mahuna, and Kayombo, traditional health practitioners and the scientists, bridging the gap in the contemporary health research in Tanzania. Available in Tanzania Health Research Bulletin, Volume 9, Number 2, of May 2007. And of recent, the folk media, and I'm concluding, the folk media has been very, very much useful in HIV AIDS campaign. Poetry. If you read a book by Aladdin Kaiselegi Mutembe in Kiswahili, Ukimwi Katika Fasihi ya Kiswahili, Mwaka F1 Mia Kenda Themana Mbili Paka F2 Sita, which means uh, HIV AIDS in uh, Swahili literature, 18, uh, 1982 to 2006, where he has a collection of, uh, uh, of stanza, poems, Gonjera now, Gonjera is difficult to put in Swahili. It's type of uh, uh, poems where two people ask and answer each other. It's like a drama, drama poetry, I can say there. And Tamithiria, Tamithiria is a, Tamithiria is theater, theater. You know, this is a difficult of thinking in Swahili and then trying to translate in English. But I'm sure you might you understand what I want to say. Uh, so you can see the way these have played a major, major, major role and they are still important. And the same has also been uh, uh, done by other, by other, by other, uh, other areas. Now in Tanzania, an area where these uh, main folk, folk media is used is in a new campaign. I don't know where in Rwanda also we have that campaign on neglected diseases. Oh, no. It's coming up here. Yeah. These neglected diseases like uh, Matende, Swahili, Matende. Elephantiasis, these tropical diseases which in no research institute is interested, neglected. So now there's a big also use of uh, folk media in campaign on uh, uh, neglected diseases to make people aware of these uh, neglected diseases. So, what I have tried to say is that actually there's a lot that can be done in this area of public health. Uh, I mean, campaign, I mean, communication for public health care, advocacy, using folk media or oral media. And therefore, using indigenous knowledge system in public health communication and advocacy. is an area which we need to research. Uh, while we are researching on your other scientific areas, but we also need to research on how we can use folk media and oral media, which is part of indigenous knowledge in enhancing public health communication and advocacy in Africa 
especially in rural areas. Especially in rural areas where newspapers may not have a big impact as in urban areas, where as much as there's TV, because you see in rural areas, even TV is still communally used. Uh, the second was saying, I know the people in the village, they want all of them to go and watch one TV. Then I rebuked him, I said, but even you, all of you want to go and watch Arsenal and Manchester in a pub. Why not watch Manchester United at your home? Don't look down at the rural people. Uh, football fans, they don't enjoy football at home. Uh, they want to go where they make noise in a pub and thumb and drink beer. But when it is done by the rural people, uh, because they are still uh, living in the community and they would want to watch TV together, it is looked upon. So let us do more research in this area so that our research findings are uh, also uh, made of uh, use and uh, benefit to our people. Uh, uh,